29 minutes after 7 o'clock here on Observer AM and uh, the United States Embassy to Barbados, the Eastern Caribbean and the OECS hosts a free public lecture on the theology of social inclusion and I have uh, both lecturers on the line of presenters. Uh, Dr. Courtright Davis is professor of theology at Howard University School of Divinity and Rector Emeritus at the Holy Comforter Episcopal Church in Washington, D.C. And accompanying him is Dr. Kane Hope Felder, Professor of the New Testament Language and Literature and Editor of the Journal of Religious Thought at the Howard University School of Divinity, also in Washington, D.C. And uh, gentlemen, I just want to thank you for joining us this morning. You're welcome. It's great to be here. All right. Thank you so much. Um, if I may, uh, Dr. Davis, uh, what is the theology of social inclusion? It really is uh, an answer to the challenges that societies face of making the distinction between those who matter and those who do not. And as Christians, and certainly as Christian thinkers and leaders, we wish to reinforce the uh, not only the notion but the faith that to affirm any belief in God is also to affirm your belief in a God who is unconditionally on the side of the poor, the oppressed, the marginalized, and the disinherited. So we are prepared and anxious to enjoin a conversation with uh, the general public in ways in which we can identify how we have uh, gone astray and not taken seriously the mandates of our faith to look after those who can't look after themselves. Every healthy society requires that you protect the unprotected. And there are so many sectors of unprotected people who need the resources, the strength, and the values of knowing that the society as a whole uh, is compassionate towards them. That's what the theology of social inclusion is all about. Okay, all right. And uh, Dr. Felder, why is such a lecture necessary in this region? We uh, want to celebrate the diversity of um, ethnic groups and racial groups. Uh, too long we have exploited and emphasized the politics of difference. And what we're trying to do is to turn that on its head and say that we're trying to bring people together in an, a reconciling manner that emphasizes the ways in which uh, we bring focus attention on people who've been marginalized and oppressed and scandalized by various uh, curses and who are in um, vulnerable social positions. And I'm talking about the LGBT community. I'm talking about uh, uh, children who have been uh, abused, uh, spousal abuse. And uh, many of us in the academy are saying that we need to be more aggressive in demonstrating how the Bible uh, and its ancient traditions uh, are now relevant as we can reflect on how um, the faith community needs to address uh, these marginalized people uh, or people who have been excluded. And so we are talking about we want to focus on inclusion rather than uh, exclusion. When you say inclusion, does it necessarily mean that you, let's say for example in the case of LGBT, that's yeah. still a controversial issue in this part of the, the, the world, in some societies more than others. Um, I can, one can say, hey, I can include, but do I necessarily have to accept? Is there a difference between the two? Well, there is a difference between the two if you mean by acceptance that you approve of a specific uh, pattern of behavior. Right. I'm, I'm talking about the inclusion in terms of re, uh, you know, defending the rights of all persons simply because they are human beings uh, and, uh, and to not allow uh, for them to be persecuted on the basis of superficial external uh, 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 judgments that are placed upon them without knowing the details of who these individuals are. So I'm saying that we, what we want to do is to show that uh, it's important to see, particularly in the Christian commitment and, and in our own biblical past, that the, the biblical ideal is to establish the people of God as a diverse group of persons who are all have a common humanity and are worthy of uh, a common sense of God's love. All right. Uh, Dr. Davis, how would you uh, describe the receptiveness to this concept 
generally in the region. I mean, have you performed this lecture anywhere else in the which, Caribbean? Which concept are you talking about? The, the, well, the theology of inclusion generally. Well, um, every society has to grapple with this issue. And certainly in the society in which I have lived and worked for the past 31 years, clearly um, there are uh, innumerable problems. Some, some would say that the problems appear not to be, um, be capable of any kind of solution. And certainly the United States has its fair share of problems of, of, of exclusion and uh, division, uh, etc., etc., and they are well known throughout the global community. So we are here at the invitation of the United States Embassy just to continue the conversation. Uh, we don't bring any solutions. We just come to raise the questions. Who are the people who matter and why do they matter? On the other hand, who are the people who are marginalized and uh, disinherited and put to the side? And why is it that we can promote a notion of democracy but yet put limits on the sense of democracy that we wish to espouse. So we have to be careful that we don't focus too much of attention on what is the sexy issue of the day, the LBGTQ issues, because we have always had lesbians, we have always had um, uh, gays, even though we call them by different names in different places. And uh, what is important for us is to recognize three very important facts. Number one, there is no person whom God did not make. Number two, there is no person whom God does not love. And number three, if God has made them and God loves them the same way that God has made and loved us, why do we make sure that they are pushed aside because we have something against them? And as Christians, we follow in the mandate and the challenge of Jesus Christ himself in which he said, and as much as you did it not unto the least and the marginalized of those who are my brothers and sisters, you did it not unto me. So we come, in, we come to this from a clearly uh, religious and ethical perspective and hope that we can enjoin a conversation that takes hold of these mandates that come not from us but from a religious tradition that is spread abroad throughout the whole of the Caribbean and certainly in Antigua where I was born and grew up and where my neighbor's string is buried. All right. Um, no, the message has this message been um, promulgated in the United States where you reside. I mean, you are uh, a theologian uh, yes. in the United States. And how? What has been the receptiveness been like the, um, in your particular location? Well, uh, the doctor. I'll ask both. Oh, I'm Dr. sorry, Doctor Fellow, yeah. you see the African American. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, Dr. Davis is now an American citizen, so we, we consider him a borrowed African American. <laughs> but it's a real pleasure to uh, report that uh, in terms of our own literature, that is various books and uh, versions of the Bible that we've edited and put together, that the reception has been really quite positive. Uh, I think that uh, you wait a long time for somebody else to tell your story that if it, uh, you take the time to research and to present the, an alternative vision of uh, people and uh, who they are, uh, then it will find its way to the uh, center and the uh, people will receive it. Uh, as long as it's documented, as long as it's not special pleading, and as long as it has a vision uh, in which the ultimate goal is to have a sense of, um, a sense of a multicultural affirmation as, as part of what we're moving towards being, uh, you know, close to what I think Dr. Martin Luther King and others call the beloved community. That's the goal. How do we establish the beloved community? I think you do that by affirming people who feel that they have been oppressed and marginalized. And I think as their respective stories are told, then you will develop um, a atmosphere that's much more congenial and affirming of people who feel that they've been put down, scandalized, and uh, treated pretty shabbily. And that's what we're trying to, that's the paradigm we're trying to change. Right, and uh, you know, you just mentioned Dr. Martin Luther King. He certainly preached a version of inclusion, you yeah, know, yes. one America, and yeah. you know, people shouldn't be judged by the color yeah. of their skin, but the content of their character. Yes, of course. But yet, that still is happening. Yes, and as long as human beings are alive and well, you will have this ongoing fight between the highest nature of ourselves and the lowest nature of ourselves. 
right? And uh, that's a struggle. But uh, what would be your response? And both of you can have a go at this. Mm -hmm. To those who think that an agenda is being pushed. Well, um, what I am saying, and I know uh, my colleague is saying, is the same thing we have been saying and teaching um, for all the years that I have been um, a professional theologian, but also all the years that I've been a pastor, and as you probably know, I was um, ordained in uh, the St. John's Cathedral way back in 1965, and from preaching there and preaching throughout and teaching throughout uh, the Caribbean and in all my writings, um, I have not deviated from this whatsoever. So far from us being part of an agenda, we see ourselves as evangelists continuing to preach the same gospel that we have been committed to all of our lives. All right. Well, the, the, the an agenda is being pushed. It's hopefully uh, a, a positive agenda. It's an agenda of inclusion, of multiculturalism, of affirming people who've been put down and marginalized too much. And I tend to think it's about time some of us who feel uh, strongly uh, about this uh, have to demonstrate that our concern is the healing of uh, people who've been abused and scandalized needlessly. And as a result, I think that this is a very positive sign of our wanting to take initiative towards reconciliation. You know, it, the term reconciliation, and Dr. Davis spoke about this to some extent yesterday, but if, if you go back to the, uh, the Greek here, it katalasso, katalasso, katalage is reconciliation, katalasso. Uh, it means really to become friends. See, so I think what we're talking about is how do we make erstwhile enemies or people who are alienated from one another, or people who can only look down on other people, how do you create a climate or a context for them becoming friends? How do becoming friends? Appreciating their story, uh, understanding their uniqueness, and then on the basis of that, trying to forge a new kind of loving community. That's the goal. That's what I have always done in my own uh, work as a professor or as a pastor is to see where do we see the alienation and divide and then how can we create a new sense of understanding among these people who don't even know, who do not know each other's story. So there is an agenda and I'm not ashamed of that. I think it's about time that the church and others are pushed to see that this is a priority agenda instead of talking about Christians Victor only. Uh, we have to talk about the Christ, Christ who comes to us from a, doing theology from below. What um, would you say to critics who say that the church has been the biggest stumbling block to inclusion in some societies, particularly as it relates to the uh, sensitive issue of LGBT? Well, first of all, we'd have to be, begin to be very comparative. Big, bigger, biggest. So you have gone for the superlative, biggest. <laughs> which has been the big one, which has been the bigger one, and which has been the biggest? The church has always been in a deficit in terms of carrying out its mission. But the church is not the institution, the church is not the building, the church is the people. And quite often um, we are known to be in deficit of the things that should really matter to us. So I would hope that as we move forward, not just with the issue of human sexuality, but also with the issue of social justice, the issue of uh, equality, and certainly with the issue of human freedom that would be reinforced by divine freedom, we take on board all the deficits that interfere with social uh, inclusion so that we can move to, a, path, to a, a, um, a position of embracing everyone. Because, you see, here is the problem. Christianity is a very difficult thing. And what makes it so difficult is that Jesus did not say that you must only love your neighbors. He gave us the most difficult thing of all, love your enemies. Now, I can't think of anybody who I would really say is my enemy, but I can think of a lot of people who are my neighbors. And when we are in the business of creating neighborhoods, we also have to generate neighborliness. And that's why whoever people are, however different they may be from us ourselves, we have that mandate from the man himself, love your neighbor as you love yourself, and love your enemies as well. Oh, and that's a that's difficult thing for us as Christians. And I'm prepared to work on it, but I'm, I'm still trying very, very hard. What about you? 
I think uh, I think we can all collectively agree with that. There you, you go. Know, there you go. Uh, people of faith. Yes. Uh, but we have to leave it there, gentlemen. Uh, so we'll have more on the night of the 19th. Oh, I look forward to that. Okay. Thank, thank you so much. We have nice talking to you. Thank you so much. All right. Dr. Cordray Davis, Dr. Kane, Hope Felder.